Satoshi Kon only made four feature films and one television series before his untimely death in 2010. The small but extraordinary body of work he left behind ensures he will always be remembered as one of the anime industry's most influential and truly original artistic voices. At the same time, Kon's achievements are made bittersweet by the lingering awareness that his incredible career was still just beginning. When he died, Kon was deep in production on what would have been his fifth feature, a fantasy adventure film called The Dream Machine. Part of the project's ambition might have been to help introduce his unique creative vision to a wider audience. This is the production history of Satoshi Kon's The Dream Machine. Satoshi Kon did not tend to make movies that were easily digested or understood. It's what made him such a great filmmaker, but it also seems to have left him struggling throughout his career for commercial success and broader recognition. His first film, Perfect Blue, was a brutally violent psychological thriller following a pop star turned actress who finds her own identity eroding as her work and her fans aggressively break down her ability to distinguish between reality and make-believe. The film is now acknowledged as a masterpiece, establishing many of the themes that would obsess Kon for the rest of his life. But at the time, in Japan at least, the movie was apparently considered something of a disaster. Possibly in response, Kon's subsequent work would be significantly lighter in tone, with more subtle undercurrents of complexity and ambiguity. Millennium Actress examined the fluidity of memory through the story of an aged film star recalling her life to a documentary crew, who became become active participants in her recollections. Tokyo Godfathers was a sentimental Christmas fable about three homeless people trying to reunite a newborn baby with her parents. It's a movie that manages to be both heartwarming and life-affirming, without ever shying away from the bleak circumstances of its characters' lives. His last two completed projects, the eerie mystery series Paranoia Agent, and the visually astonishing surrealist Fantasia Paprika were perhaps his most accessible and exemplary. Each was an innovative and unpredictable journey into worlds literally being invaded by their own collective dreams and fantasies. These works have all enjoyed varying degrees of success over time, but none of them were major hits on initial release. Allegedly, Kun had difficulty finding supporters within the industry, and had to abandon several productions early on, apparently due to lack of interest. A few of these can be glimpsed in the book The Art of Satoshi Kon. One is a theatrical feature titled Reverse, from sometime in the late 90s, about which no details seem to be known. Another from about the same era is an OVA series called Phantom. This would have been an action story, about clones hunting their original selves, some of whom are discovered to be clones themselves. Around 2007, shortly after completing Paprika, Khan set his sights on expanding his audience with a movie that would depart from his usual themes and appeal to younger viewers. It's often referred to as Dreaming Machine, which is a direct translation of the original Japanese title. But according to Khan himself, the title in English was originally supposed to be The Dream Machine. The film may have spent about two years in production before Khan was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer. After his death in 2010, production was suspended, then briefly resumed later that year, with character designer Yoshimi Itazu in charge. Working from Khan's completed screenplay and storyboards, as well as the detailed instructions he had left behind, the remaining team was reportedly able to complete 600 of the film's 1,500 shot total, resulting in about 26 minutes of finished animation. By mid-2011, production had been suspended again for financial reasons. In 2012, producer Masao Maruyama stated there was still an effort being made to finish the film, but as time passed, its completion started to look less and less likely. In 2016, Maruyama revealed that a replacement director could not be found, and by 2018 said the movie was essentially cancelled. He left open the possibility of one day resuming production, if the right talent came along. But at this point, it doesn't look like there's much chance of that ever happening. We still can't say exactly what the finished film would have been like, but with all the artwork and plot information that has turned up over the years, 
it is possible to put together a fairly reasonable facsimile of Kun's intentions for it. Some character designs and plot information, dated 2008, show up in the art of Satoshi Kon. Layouts show the three main characters, Robin, Ririko, and King. The details of their design give us a sense of the retro-futurist aesthetic Kon was going for, reminiscent of Osamu Tezuka's Astro Boy. The plot is summarized in the notes. In a far-off future where humans have gone extinct, three robots set out on a journey to find a rumored electric paradise. Our hero, Robin, experiences a coming of age along the way, visually symbolized by his steady exchanging of parts that physically transform him from a child to an adult. An in-depth article on Animation Obsessive helps to fill in some of these details. The story begins in a flooded city, populated by a single, nameless, headless robot, originally designed by humans to perform labor, who has continued working even after his creators have vanished. Another article on the same site mentions that this basic idea turned out to be very similar to Pixar's WALL-E, which came out while Dream Machine was in production. Kon was apparently worried by this at first, but brushed it off when he saw how different both stories were in execution. Another robot, Ririko, washes up in the city one day, gives this robot a head and a name, Robin, and shortly afterward both are expelled from the city by a tsunami. Outside the city, electricity is in short supply, and robots die without it. Robin and Ririko hear about the fabled land of electricity, where the power never runs out, and set out to find it with a blue battle bot named King. They come across strange characters and challenges throughout their journey, including an army that hoards electricity. And as the childlike Robin gains wisdom and maturity, he rebuilds his own body to reflect the capable young man he is becoming. Kon said in interviews that although the film was aimed at kids, it was being created with an eye towards pleasing adults as well. Key animator Aya Suzuki recalls that the script contained many scary and dark moments, suggesting that Kon was not just making a conventional children's movie. These few bits and pieces are enough to suggest that, like the rest of Khan's work, the Dream Machine could have been something strange and special. Sadly, we'll never know for sure. As far as I'm aware, in spite of continued interest from fans, none of the film's completed footage has ever been seen publicly. A recent documentary by Pascal Alex Vincent called Satoshi Kon the Illusionist, was originally going to feature clips of this footage, much to the excitement of the online film community, but this plan had to be dropped because of rights issues. Material continues to find its way out, and we'll probably see more in the future, but currently there doesn't appear to be any plan to release those 26 minutes of finished animation anytime soon. Given that it's the last thing he made before he died, incomplete or not, it feels like the least that can be done to honor Khan's memory is to give those fragments a place where they can actually be appreciated. The demand is there, and it seems to be growing stronger as the years go by. Maybe someday we will get to see them. Kun wasn't granted the time to finish this movie, and that's a tragedy. He didn't get to tell all of the stories he should have been able to tell. But life makes its own plans, and most of the time we're just along for the ride. The fact that Kon did leave us too soon is reason to value the stories he did get to tell all the more. An artist doesn't get to choose their legacy. As an audience, however, we get to choose how we honor that legacy.